We'll go to John chapter 10. A little worried that Bill Jr. going to get on my message. He did just a hair, but not too much. I'd like to cover quite a bit of the chapter today. Let's begin in verse number 1. Read through verse number 5. John 10, verse 1. Christ speaking here. He they left off chapter 9 speaking with Pharisees. So I'm assuming we're still speaking to the Pharisees here. If you remember at the beginning of chapter 9, Christ had healed the man who was blind from his birth. That man, his parents went to the Pharisees and presented himself. And they questioned him and his parents. Then towards the end of chapter, Christ came unto him and I if I understand correctly, saved the soul at that point. And then the Jews would begin to speak to Jesus at the end of the chapter. And here we pick up in verse 1 of chapter 10. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Yeah. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The end the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. He putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth forth, for he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And the stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of the stranger. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for this day, Lord, this opportunity to worship thee today, Lord, with thy people in my house. I pray that you would meet with us, Lord. I thank you for the Singing and the Sunday school message that we've heard, Lord. I pray you be with the preaching hour and hour that you would speak to us through that word. You might stir us up even as your people. You might save souls among us. I do pray to be with Larry if he's out sick. That you might heal him up, Lord. And the others as well that aren't able to be here, that you would bless them in their needs, Lord. I thank you for this church here and the truth that it stands on. I pray that you call us to grow in truth, Lord. Lead God direct by the Holy Spirit. I thank you for Christ and his sacrifice. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. So here, Jesus begins this chapter by talking about the shepherd and the sheep. And we and Adam had a little bit of this conversation about how smart sheep were and they're not the brightest of animals. But they usually do one of two things. They either follow the one who's leading them or they try to wander off and have to be brought back in. Yeah. And we are the same way, aren't we? Yeah. We were following Christ or we are wandering away from Him. Yeah. And as the good shepherd, He'll bring us back in line. I can't imagine being snapped up by the neck and yanked back over what's pleasant for the sheep. But yet it was necessary, wasn't it? Yeah. But here he says that he that entereth not by the door in the sheepfold, the sheepfold is was a building or enclosure where the sheep were kept. It says, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. When I thought about who he was speaking of here, and considering he was speaking to the Pharisees, I think he was mostly talking about them, the Pharisees. Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes who they really didn't care for the sheep. Yeah. So they were a thief and a robber. The thief and the robber, they don't right. have any care for what they're breaking into. Right. They come but to steal and to destroy. Right. Really for their own personal gain. That's what a robber and thief seeks. Yeah. So it is with all others besides Christ who men tend to follow whether it's Muhammad or whether it's Joseph Smith or whether it's Charles Russell, one of these others, or Alexander Campbell, we have all these false teachers today which men to follow. They don't care for the sheep as the shepherd does. So he says, but he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. 
Speaking of himself, he is the shepherd of the sheep. In fact, he's called that in several places. So going all the way back to Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We were in 1 Peter 2.25, tells us that Christ is the shepherd and bishop of our souls. You know, I found it interesting that the word shepherd is also translated as pastors in Ephesians 4.11. You know, the pastors are supposed to be a, a type of shepherd for the sheep, an overseer of the sheep, if you will. But Christ, he is the great shepherd, Hebrews call him. It says, To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. So the porter is the doorkeeper, or like a security guard today. I was trying to read on who this porter was exactly. There's different theories. Some say it's the gospel preachers. Some say it's the angels. Some say it's the Holy Spirit. And others, the God the Father. Whoever it is, he only opens for Christ. I'm led to believe, it's the, speaking of the Holy Spirit here, that he's the one who opens the door for Christ to come into the sheep for him. Yeah. The poor doesn't open for these false teachers, these robbers and thieves, they have to climb up some other way. And it says, this, The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. What a great thought that is that Christ calls the sheep by name. That's right. We're not sheep one, sheep two, sheep three. No, he knows Brother Junior by name. He knows yep. Brother Matthew, Brother Eric, Sister yep. Castle, Sister Donna, all, everyone here who's been saved by the grace of God. He knows each of us by name. He calls us by name, he says. And he leaves them out. He, to be led of Christ is a mark that we are a child of God. But Paul puts it a little differently, but in Romans 8, 14, he says, as many as are led of the Spirit, are the sons of God. You can be sure the world is not led of God in any sort of way. That's right. They might be led by a spirit, but it's not the spirit of God. But Christ, he says, he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. And when he put it forth, verse 4, his own sheep, he goes before them. And he doesn't just send us out there and leave us to ourselves, does he? He says he goes before us. Really as, a, as a good shepherd, he walks in front of the sheepfold and instead of he doesn't walk behind the flock, does he? Right. Without without our wolves and foxes and lions and other such creatures that would desire to kill the sheep. Oh, but our shepherd, he walks ever before us, taking care of those things, doesn't he? He put his forth to those sheep, and he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they have not known the voice of strangers. His sheep don't follow the voice of strangers. His sheep don't follow after all these others that are thieves and robbers. As I was thinking on that, I don't see very many of the Pharisees, scribes, and Sadducees that followed Christ in his day, did they? Most of those were the ones who were opposed to him and his teachings. It was usually the, the rejects and outcasts, those are most of the ones who followed Christ. Yeah. We do see Paul as one of the exceptions to that. Certainly God is able to save anyone, but when he saves a person, they're not going to follow after the false religions of this world. I know sometimes we can get tangled up in sin and get in a mess. As Brother Brother Junior was talking about some this morning. But yet he'll always bring his sheep back to the fold, doesn't he? Yeah. So he had 
parable of the 99 sheep, would you let them the fold to go out and get the one that was lost? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can be sure Christ will save his sheep. And we'll go on to verse 6 here. It says, This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were, what things they were which he spake unto them. The Jews here, they couldn't understand what Christ was telling them. They couldn't, they couldn't understand. He was really talking about them. They were not leading the flock of God's sheep like they should be. That he was the good shepherd. It would be in, that seems a little bit, I don't want to say insignificant, but it's even more significant when you read later on in the chapter here. So then Jesus said unto them, verse number seven, again, verily I say unto you, and he kind of changes his focus a little bit and explains it to him a different way. He says, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me. If any man or any shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but to for to steal and to kill and destroy, I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. But Christ says he is the door. He's the only door of the sheep, isn't he? There's not some other way to heaven, as people say. No. All roads certainly don't lead there. No. I think the reason why most people say all roads lead to heaven is because they're all on the wide road. Yeah. And they think they're on different roads. I'm afraid they're going to find out one day that they're we're on that road that led to destruction rather than the one that leads to life. Mm -hmm. No, Jesus is, said the only way to the Father, he says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. No, he is the door of the sheep, and he says, All that ever came before me were thieves and robbers. The sheep did not hear them. And certainly there were false prophets that came up and tried to offer false ways or false assurance to the people of God. But it says his sheep, they didn't hear him. His sheep don't listen to those delusions, if you will. And this passage makes me wonder about it. those who, and we know some that left the truth and went to following after the law and keeping to the law again that they were ever truly saved to begin with. He says, his sheep don't follow after these others. All that ever came before me were thieves and robbers. Certainly he wasn't talking about the true prophets such as Moses and Elijah and John the Baptist. But all those that came and offered salvation in some sort of way, they were thieves and robbers. All those that even the Pharisees who said, do this and do that, and they'll be right before God. They were thieves and robbers in that sense. And it came, and it says here, thief cometh not but for to steal and kill and destroy. So look at verse 9 again. I skipped over that. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. If we enter in by Christ, he says, we will truly be saved. Yeah. If you truly go to Christ for salvation, He certainly will save you. But we can't go to Him with our good works. We can't go to Him off. We can't go to God and offer that we've been a member of so-and-so church. We can't go to God and anything besides Christ and expect to be saved. Well, we can be sure if we go by the way of Christ, we shall be saved. He said, he shall go in and out and find pasture. Going back to Psalms 23, the second verse, was it say, Lord, my shepherd, I shall not want he make me to lie down in green pastures, leave me beside still waters. Oh, God gives his sheep good pasture to feed in, doesn't he? The world doesn't have a good pasture for the sheep of God. It's mostly a dry desert out there, isn't it? But, oh, God has green pastures for his sheep. And he said he'll lead us in and out. 
I think too many times we're stubborn and don't want to follow them, do we? The thief comes to my book for to steal and to kill and destroy. I am coming that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. What does Acts 4 12 say? That neither is there salvation any other, and there's no other name given in heaven whereby we must be saved. So Christ is the only way in which we can be saved. But yet, and yet he has come to give life and give it more abundantly, he says. I think we're all familiar with Ephesians 2 1 that says he quickened us who were dead in trespasses and sins. You know, Romans 6 23 it says, The way to sin is death, to give to God eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, we were dead spiritually. We got Christ came that he might give us life. <coughs> and he says here, they might give it more abundantly. Yeah. Well, I can't think of any more abundant life than that which lasts for all of eternity in the presence of God. You know, contrary to what Joel's team may preach, our best life isn't now. Well, we can be a blessed life now, maybe, but well, the best life for the child of God awaits on the other side of eternity. And he goes on in verse 11 to say, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And really, this is how we have salvation is from Christ giving his life for the sheep. And I don't think it's any mystery to us that he gave his life for us. But oh, what a blessed thought that is that as a shepherd he would give his life for the sheep. They so cares for the sheep that he would die for us. As Romans 5 puts it in the law, yet sinners Christ died for us. And we weren't worthy to be, for him to die on our behalf, we weren't worthy of salvation in any sort, but yet he was pleased to come and to secure yeah. that for us. Yeah. You know what? As I go on to say, the hireling, he doesn't, the hireling wouldn't die for this people, would he? So he doesn't care for the sheep. But oh, the care of God, the love of God for his sheep, that he would, as the good shepherd, give his own life for us. It really ought to be an humbling thought as his people. Let's go ahead and read the next few verses here. It says, But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and cares not for the sheep. So those quote unquote prophets and those, I don't know what you would call them, such as Muhammad that offer what they call salvation, they didn't care for the sheep, did they? Yes. They don't even care for the ones who call after them. Right. Oh, but Christ cares for his sheep. So the fact that he knows us all by name and calls us and leads us ought to show that he cares for us, then that he died for us to give us salvation. And even now we can make inter he makes intercession for us that he sits on the right hand of God. Right. Or as when Peter said, we ought to cast we are to cast all our cares upon him for he cares for you. Yeah. What a great thought that the shepherd cares for the sheep. That he's not a hired man. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I was watching after some sheep somewhere and a wolf would come in and I didn't have anything to pin myself, I'd probably get out of there too. Hmm. The shepherd's not doesn't do that. The shepherd would give his life if so called upon. The good shepherd would at least. Yeah. That's right. You know, the hireling, he please, he says, he, when he sees a wolf coming. I'm afraid there's many so-called pastors today that are nothing more than hirelings, though. Yeah. Yeah. When the wolf comes, they run off somewhere else. Let's go on to verse 14 here. He says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep, and am known in mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. 
we kind of reiterate what he's already said here, that he is the good shepherd. He knows his sheep, and his sheep know him. You know, there's none of this, uh, I hope I'm going to be saved, like the junior mentioned. Yeah. You either know Christ or you don't know him. Yeah. Yeah. There was a song, I can't remember who sung it, Southern Gospel song says, Won't give me that hope so, maybe so salvation. Yeah. No, we either know Christ or you don't know him. In fact, was it over in it's over in Matthew chapter seven where he speaks to those who were came to him and said, Lord, have we not preached in thy name and in thy name done many wonderful works and in thy name cast out devils? And we say, uh, then I'll profess unto them, Apart from me he works with iniquity, for I never knew you. See, Christ is known as you forever, hasn't he? Sure. And the goats, he doesn't know, not in that way. Certainly God knows everybody, but in a personal way, he doesn't know the goats like he does the sheep. In fact, over in Peter, he tells us that we were elected according to the foreknowledge of God. Mm -hmm. Of course, our Armenian will say, well, that means that he looked down and saw, he knew that you would believe it, so then he chose you. I don't know, that doesn't make any sense to me, but Oh, the foreknowledge of God that he knew us personally before time ever existed. Right. Okay. Over in Romans 8, he tells us that, that he whom we did predestinate, them he also mm -hmm. called, and then we called him. All right. I'm going to turn over there. I'm going to mess it up if I try to go. Romans 8. Verse 28, he says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For who he did foreknow. See, there's that personal knowledge. Not that he knew what we would do, but that he knew us personally. He did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, moreover whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, him he also justified, them he justified, them he also glorified. Right. You can be sure if you're a child of God, you're as good as glorified already inside of God. So without getting ahead of myself, no man going to be able to take that away from us. Right. Yeah. Really, if God foreknew, those he foreknew, he shall not cast away, he says. Yeah. But as the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Notice verse 16. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. The other sheep of us, I believe. The Gentiles, if you will. Here he was speaking to the Jews. Certainly he had sheep which were the Jews. But he had this other sheep, he said, which. I have which are not of this fold, but he said he would, he must also bring them, and they shall hear my voice, and they shall be one fold, one shepherd. Sure. And now in Christ Jesus, we're neither Jew nor Gentile, he says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. Really, we're one fold even now in Christ. Therefore, verse 17, does my Father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again? No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Amen. This commandment I received of my Father. And no man took the life of Christ, but he, he willingly laid it down. Yeah. Yeah. No one certainly they crucified him, certainly they put him there in that position, but <laughs> except he had cried to his finish, I don't think he would have gave up the ghost at that time. He willingly gave it down, he said, or he willingly laid it down that he might take it up again. So the Bible says that he rose again the third day, didn't he? Of his own power and of the power of God's Father. No one may take it from me that I may lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down, I have power to take it up again. It was, he described himself in Revelation as the one who was. Alive and was dead is alive forevermore. When Christ died for our sins, what a great glorious thought, but oh, even more so that he 
resurrected the third day, they might defeat death. If it were not for resurrection, also we would be of all men most miserable. Our faith would be in vain, and we would be yet in our sins. Oh, but Christ rose, we can be sure of that. That he rose, that one day will, in the same fashion, rise in immortality. As Paul says, this mortal shall put on immortality, and this corruption shall put on incorruption, and shall be brought past the same death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, our God has power over death, hell, and the grave. It was displayed very plainly in the life of Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. The Jews, they still didn't understand this, did they? After all this that he explained to them in verse 19, it says there was a, a division, therefore, among the Jews for these things. And many of them said, he hath the devil and is mad. Why hear you him? And they said, this guy is crazy. Basically what they were saying. And the other, there were others there that had a little more sense, I guess. And they said, others said, these are not the words of him that hath the devil. Can the devil open the eyes of the blind? Yeah. And they still didn't understand who he was. They said, he can't be of the devil. The devil doesn't open the eyes of the blind. The devil doesn't do these miracles which we've seen them do. But yet, the key would be here in a few verses later why they couldn't understand him, why they couldn't comprehend what he was saying. Because the flesh received not the things of the Spirit, Paul said. We can't attempt to understand spiritual matters in a fleshly sense. Verse 22 and 23, it says, And it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of the Dedication, and it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. It seems that a little bit of time was passed. Maybe he was had continued on from where he was with the blind man and had made it to the temple now. This Feast of Dedication, which was in the winter, is a modern day what we would call Hanukkah, which was set up during the Maccabees. I just thought it was interest, interesting that Christ was there during this feast. And he was in the temple walking into Solomon's porch, it says. Then came the Jews round about him. Verse 24, they, they surround him, if you will. And said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Just tell us plainly, if you're the Christ, if you're the Savior, really he already had them, hadn't he? That's, that's what he said in the next verse. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe me not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness to me. And I've already told you that I'm the Christ. I'm, basically he said, I've already showed you as well. My works are proof that I am, that I am from the Father. But they, don't, they didn't believe what he told them. And if he had said plainly there that he is the Christ, they wouldn't have believed him either. Just a few verses later, they're going to take up stones to stone them with. Yeah. In verse 26, he says, But you believe me not, and here's the key, because you are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. The goats, they don't understand the things of the sheep. And the goats, Oftentimes they'll get offended by the, the shepherd, don't they? The ghost don't follow after the shepherd. So those that are unsaved and in the flesh, they cannot understand the things of the God. The world attempts to sometimes to understand the Bible and the Word of God, but yet, unless they've been born again, they'll never understand it. Fleshly reasoning and logic cannot reveal the truth of the Word of God to us. It takes the Spirit of God revealing it to us. You know, if you're not saved here today, it's really not your concern whether you're a sheep or a goat, God will reveal it to you in this time. Really, here's how we can know if one is a sheep or a goat. 
they're guilty, they will die, and their sin will go to hell. If they're sheep, God will work on them and deal with them according to their sin and save their souls. It may be in the young ages of their life, it may be on the death, but I don't know. But yet, we can be sure not one of God's sheep will be lost. It says, my sheep, verse 27, hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my father, or out of my hand. My father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Oh, the, probably some of the greatest verses we have for what we call security of the believer. Yeah. That no man can pluck us or snatch us out of the hand of Christ. Right. And he says, and then again, no man can pluck us out of the Father's hand. You know, I've, I've heard one Armenian fellow say, well, you can't, no man can snatch you out of his hand, but you can jump out if you want to. <laughs> I don't think they understand the vastness of the hand of God. Isaiah 40 tells us that he, he's held all the waters in the hallow of his hand. I can't imagine all the waters that are in the world, the oceans, the rivers, the, the seas, all that's underneath, all that's in the clouds, all that's really even out, if there's any out there in space somewhere. He said, just right in the palm of his hand, he's had it all right there. If man foolishly thinks he could jump out of that. And then I heard another Armenian fellow who believed in spirit of believers say that you know, I believe once you saved you, you'd always be saved whether you want to be or not. I don't know of anyone who ever truly been born again that doesn't want to be saved. No, notice he says here that we are his sheep, and he knows us, and we follow him. Yeah. Not that we might follow him, or we ought to, but and he gives us eternal life, he says, and they shall never perish. Never perish still means never perish, doesn't it? Not they might not perish, or hopefully they don't perish, but he says they never will. That's right. Then neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Oh, my Father which gave them me is greater than all. Well, God the Father, he's greater than all. He's greater than Satan himself. He's greater than man and all his doings. If you don't mind, I'd like to read some of the Brother Pink wrote on this, these verses here. I've got to hear them. I don't want to write it all out. But he says, speaking on these verses, John 10, 27 through 29, he says, No stronger passage in all the Word of God can be found guaranteeing the absolute security of every child of God. Note the seven strands in the rope which binds them to God. He says, First, they are Christ's sheep. He says, They're my sheep, hear my voice. And it is the duty of the shepherd to care for each of his flock to suggest that any of Christ's sheep may be lost to blaspheme the shepherd himself. Second, they said they follow. Christ and no exceptions are made. The Lord does not say they ought to, but declares they do. And if then the sheep follow Christ, they must reach heaven, for that is where the shepherd is gone. Third, to the sheep is in part eternal life. To speak of eternal life meaning is a contradiction in terms. This fourth, the eternal life, this eternal life is given to them. They did not, or they did nothing to merit it. Consequently, they did nothing to demerit it. But we didn't do anything to earn eternal life, and there's nothing we can do to right. discern it or to right. lose it. And he says, fifth, the Lord himself declares that his sheep shall never perish. Consequently, the man who declares that it is possible for a child of God to go to hell makes God a liar. The sixth, the shepherd's hand or from the shepherd's hand, none is able to pluck them. Hence, the devil is unable to encompass the destruction of a single one of them. Seventh, above them is the Father's hand. Hence, it is impossible for them to jump out of the hand of Christ, even if they try to. It has been well said that if one soul who trusted in Christ should be missing in heaven, there would be one vacant seat there, one crown unused, one heart unstrung, and this would grieve all of heaven and proclaim a disappointed God. But such a thing is utterly impossible. Yeah. Oh, how I like what he said there, and that 
regarding that, how that no man can pluck us out of his hand. No man can overcome God, can he? When he said never perish, God meant it that they will never perish. The fact that God gives us eternal life means there's nothing we can do in of ourselves to lose that eternal life. Uh, those here in this moment, let's read verse 30 though. It says, I and my Father are one. The Jews couldn't comprehend that, could they? So he speaks there of no man can pluck him out of his hand. And the Father which no man can pluck out of the Father's hand. <coughs> then he goes on to say that him and his Father are one. Really the two hands that they're one the same. The Jews, they took up stones to stone them after that in verse 31. He finally told them what they wanted to hear and they didn't want to hear it. So yeah, I am from the Father. I am. And he said, I and my Father are one. He was the Christ. Truly, he was the Christ. And yet, because they weren't of his sheep, they didn't want to hear this. They wanted to hear it. I guess of someone who would give them what they were looking for. I know Israel as a nation was looking for a, a political savior more than a spiritual one. But God's kingdom is not of this world, is it? It's what he told his disciples. He said, if it were so, I told you to fight. Well, if you're not here today, all they can do is point you to Christ. So he is the only way, as we saw earlier. Not our good works, not our church membership, not our baptism, not our dollars we put in the tithe box. Not all these false ways which man offers to salvation. It's only through Christ and Him alone that one can be saved. Yeah. Well, we, can, we can be sure, though, if He does save us, we're as good to go. Of eternity, really only <coughs> eternity awaits the child of God, eternity in the presence of God, that is. It's not that one day we'll get there and hope we'll be saved. No, we can be sure that if He's truly saved us, we'll be in His presence one day for all of eternity. That'll cause us to rejoice as His people. <laughs> that it's not just this life, it's not just this old wicked world that we have to endure, then maybe if we're, if we're good enough, we'll get to go through the pearly gates, as the saying goes. No Peter's not standing there walking me nose and have some sort of checklist. No, I think, I think we see it in the life of Stephen. Christ stands up and welcomes his sheep when they come home. Oh, what a, I don't know what I can't think of the word joy that it causes that we're eternally secure in Christ that we've truly been born again yeah. so we, yeah. can, we can get in a mess certainly yeah. well, but if we just confess our sins he is faithful and does forgive us for yeah. sins let's close that thought whether you want to come